Um, so what are S4 classes? So it is a more formal approach to functional OOP, which we saw S3 was not, and that R6 was like completely you know, over the top. So it is an important new component of, uh, of S4 is something called slot, which is a name component of the object that is accessed using a specialized subsetting op uh, operator at, which is something we haven't encountered. And we'll get into what slots are um, shortly. So all the methods which are, uh, all the functions which are related to S4 live in the methods package. And it is pretty much installed in R when you start up the session. So you don't actually need to do the installation. Um, and here there's um, there's different methods here. There's a lot of methods, and here I'll just I'll find a few of them. There's set class, set generic, set method, and of course new. Uh, you also have accessor functions, which enable you to set generic functions, uh, which enable you to um, there's a typo there, which enable you to set methods, etc. Or you can get generic, and you can also define class. So Class can be defined uh, by specifying the class name and a named character vector which has names and classes of slots. And by slots, all they mean are the, um, uh, the features. Uh, it, it's basically a named vector where uh, you have the, uh, the, the name and the class of uh, each of the variables. But not sure if that's the right way to define it, but um, we'll go as we go along, you'll see it. Uh, and we have a prototype which uh, is advisable that you use it, but not absolutely required. It specifies the default values for each of the slots. So what are the basics of S4, and how do you define a class? So the standard um, statement is basically set class, and person here is the name of the class. And here you're defining your slot, which is, again, a name vector. So name is a character, and age is a numeric. And here they don't have a prototype, which uh, is optional and not required. So um, I've just provided the execution of, I, I, didn't, I did not have the courage to do this, uh, to do a real time coding at this stage. So I ran it in our markdown and, and I just provided the output. But uh, this is um, what you see here is that when you do run, um, uh, which yeah. So when you create, when, when I say new, which is basically I'm creating an object of class person. I create an object Nostradamus, and when I uh, when I uh, when I'm trying to see what class or what uh, the value of the slots are, I can either do it by using the at character, which is not recommended, or you can use slot and look for age. And since we did not specify an age, it returns back an N A. So uh, it is, uh, gives you the class that Nostradamus is, uh, belongs to, and the others just will do the the slots in, in the class. So um, it's recommended that you don't use at, so you basically don't access your uh, slots directly because you want to keep it as generic as possible so that it can be used in other classes. And so for that, you define uh, generic. And, and that's where it starts getting a little bit more rigorous relative to S3, because here you will actually say what you want um, the slots to be, and then you can also define methods based on those generics. So the first thing we're going to do here is that we're going to say set generic, and it, it's going to have um, the same name as what, um, what the generic that you defined. So for example, here you have name and age, and here you're going to uh, call it the same as the name that you gave it in the class, and you're going to uh, you necessarily have to say standard generic and provide the same name again there. So this is basically like the, the gateway uh, through which um, R will basically route it to the appropriate method based on what um, your, the, based on the class of the, based on the signature of the class that is being passed to it. And we'll get into that in a moment. Um, so here, the first one was for getting the age slot value, and the second one is for setting it. So that's why you have that that operator where you're assigning it to age. So when, uh, when you run those two, you basically get just the, the name of uh, the generic functions. But it doesn't do anything because there is no point in having generic if you cannot have methods, which actually will be what the generics uh, will direct um, the functioning to based on, again, the signature of the class. 
So the set method will have the name of the generic. So for example, the first one, test method is applying the name of the first generic. It gives, it, it specifies the class. So the reason you want to do, um, the reason that there's a difference between the generic and the method is because you want to have the, your target and what I guess what is called your um, destination. I forget if it's destination or something else, but this is basically telling you that this method has been defined in this class person. So if you have either multiple inheritance or you have a case where you have multiple dispatching, which we'll get into, then you know where that method has been defined. And that is the reason why uh, set method will, will require you to provide that signature, signature of the class that it expects. And then you will go on to actually define your, um, uh, define your function. So here in this case, person is, um, the, is, is, is the class. And then this is the actual function definition of um, the set method H. So um, then you have the other one. For, so one is basically for getting the value. The other one is for setting the value. And what you're doing here is that you're assigning value to um, at age. And so if you look at this example where I look at age of Nostradamus, who was the, per the object that was created of class Nostradamus, I set the age to be 50. And so when I uh, specifically look at that slot, which again, if you recall, slot is one of uh, is one of the features of this particular class. It returns back 50. So I have a I have a quick question. Is set generic? Can you kind of draw an analogy in your mind with that and use method in S3, or would that be set method? Oh, or use, use method. Yeah. So I think with use method, um, what was it? It was um, it was uh, method dot class, correct? So like the dot class is sort of implicit in the call. So that's something that you that basically R does for you that it uses the class name. I mean, it, it basically suffixes on the dot class and and it finds whatever classes. Of. So I think this is a little bit more rigorous in that you actually have to the the class would have, uh, in other words, when you call set method, if the signature does not follow um, this particular class of person, then um, it will basically not work. So Ooh. I think it's the same, but I think it's more rigorous. Does that answer Got the it. question? Yeah, that makes sense. So, um, yeah, so, uh, and by the way, I would, I, this took me a really long time to wrap my brain around, and I, it, like, literally, I spent, like, days looking at it and didn't get it. So, when they say, when it says person here, that particular class is actually referring to the, the function parameter. So, it, it's the argument. So, the X that you see in function, that is an object of type of class person. It's not, and I, for some reason, it took me a really long time to, to get that. But when, when you're looking at that signature, that signature basically has the signature of what is being passed into the function as argument or arguments. And this becomes really relevant later when we look at multiple dispatch, dispatch which is quite a, I mean, it takes, it's, it's pretty confusing. I don't think I got it, but anyway. Um, so that's set generic and set method. So let's actually get into like creating a class with all that we know so far. So we again have a class person. We have our slot, which is the named vector. And here we've actually defined the prototype. We basically said that the name is, uh, is a character vector of length zero. So in other words, if you haven't specified that, you at least have like a so-called default. And the age is a real uh, vector of uh, length zero. So if I create a new, uh, and if I use new, which um, as we know, is, is a constructor, um, and we apply the name of the class, and then we provide the name. The age has not been specified here. We will actually get back, um, the, the object will be of type person, it belongs to the global environment, um, and it has two slots, and the slots are as what has been defined. So, So then there's another part of this, which is inheritance. So um, as we know, S4 supports multiple inheritance, and we can specify that by, by this clause called contains. So this can either tell you that it's 
it, it, it's derived from a class or multiple classes. And so when it, when it actually inherits from multiple classes, it inherits the slot and the methods from, and the genetics from too. Um, though I have not seen that explicitly stated, I would imagine that that would happen also. So we can create an employee class uh, that inherits from the person class, and we can add an extra slot that describes their boss. So this contains name and age, which we don't have to re-specify because it's carried over from person. But you also have uh, an additional slot, which is only specific to the employee class, and that is boss. And here we define the prototype for that, um, for that particular uh, slot. And it, it's a person, again, because um, uh, obviously that's, it has the same slots as a, what a person would, which, which is name and age. Uh, and so when you run that and you look for and, and you um, do the create an uh, create an object and you look for the details, you can see here that it's created in the global environment. The um, person package, yeah. So it is in the global environment, and it tells you that it you have the formal class person, and then you have employee, which uh, which again belongs. Uh, I guess derived from the person, which I'm guessing that's what it means, and that it has boss name and age as its slots. So, yeah, so it tells you that employee has three slots and person has two slots, and so it's um, it's got the additional slot that you define here. And when you look for type um, to see what class it inherits from, person obviously is just person, but then employee would give you employee and the person, so it gives you also the superclass um, that. Um, employee belongs to. So that is inheritance. And of course, you can have multiple inheritance. That is, you can have multiple classes. Um, and we will see that that's something that Hadley does not recommend in this book, uh, multiple inheritance. So uh, there's something called helper functions and validator functions. Again, just to make the whole process of creating a class as generic as possible. So obviously, they don't want you accessing the slot. Um, you know, directly because you want that level, I guess, of abstraction between yourself and, um, and, and, and the class where it is defined. So it is, it is basically uh, new as a low-level constructor, which is something that we use as developers. But then if you want to package these things into, um, if you want to create your own R package and you want to, you know, you want other people to use it, then you definitely need to have helper functions because you don't want people creating um, uh, they, you don't want them accessing new, which is um, which is I guess something that we would do internally. So sort of like the dot, uh, etc. Naming convention that we've seen in the past. So your um, uh, your constructor here would have the same name as a class. So the class is person. The constructor would be person, and it would um, you you would define this within your um, class, and you would say that. Um, you, you would basically make a call to new there. So then that way, the person that's implementing this class does not actually have to say new. They would, they, they would just say person, and then they, they could pass in whatever, the name and the age. And it, it basically does exactly what you saw earlier. You would have um, a subclass person, and then there is no age, and of course the name is as what has been said. So this is a helper function, a helper constructor function. Um, and you can also define something called a validator. So if you, um, let's say you have, um, 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 so this class has the na name and age, and let's say you have 300 people in that. You would like to have 300 people. And that means you have one record for each person. Well, it turns out that you haven't actually specified the length of each vector or like how, what is the length of each record. So a person, Nostradamus, can actually have two age um, variables associated. I mean, he, he could have two uh, age, whatever, two ages, age numbers or whatever associated. So to make sure that you don't um, actually have that situation where um, you could have multiple records for one person, you can specify that you want the length of your name object to be the same as the length of the age object. So Nostradamus is like 55, uh, Jake is like five, you know, so you can't have a, a, a vector which is different in length for like multiple record for, for each record. So you can you can actually set, set call this function called set validity, and you would uh, again define the class and specify the class, and then you would say that if they are not the same length, then you would uh, it, there would be an error message. Else you would say it true, and then it would proceed. So if I created Nostradamus 
object and I said and the age that I gave were had two entries in it, then it would basically stop. It would say that name and age must be the same length and it, it would not create that. So it actually did not create that object. However, if I change that and I and I have like one and they are the same length, then it'll go ahead and create that. So then that way so it, I guess it's just to point out that you can set up validity checks and then ensure like the quality of your data and the integrity of each record so that you're not you know, you're not having having records. So, um, and so, like, actually, this starts to get really interesting. Like, I thought this was like pretty cool um, because uh, genetics and methods, I think, are really the meat and bones of S3 and how um, how it sort of is distinguished from, uh, I'm sorry, S4 and how it, it it provides a level of stringency that that S3 does not have. So, you always you always want to define generics. So, you want to before you define methods to go with your class, you always want to set the generics because those are sort of the phase that you present to the outside world and which people can then use to implement their own methods. So I would start off by saying, hey, I want to set um, a generic function. So the first thing here is the name of your function, and then you would call, uh, the, uh, so this is basically the template. Then you would say standard generic and, and you would specify the same name here again. And so this is the first generic that you have created called my generic. And then there is no point in having a generic if you don't have a method to go with the generic. So what you would do here is that you would say, this is a definition of, um, oh, excuse me, actually, so um, this, this is actually talking about the signature, sorry. It's still the generic definition I thought I had gotten into method. But it talks about something really important right now. And this is where you have the segue that, that Maya just brought up about the use method that S3 has, which is a little bit more like hand baby in nature, but S4 is, I think, um, it, it's probably a little bit more rigorous. So the signature actually provides the class that, um, that the class that of object that can be used uh, in this particular function argument. So when I say that this my this generic function called my generic and this is my function definition i'm going to say that i expect the argument here in this particular function to confirm to the standards of whatever is being passed in the signature line and so whatever class that signature specifies and there can be multiple classes then you would have multiple arguments in your function your function would have to necessarily follow those particular object types and if they didn't, then it would um, it would not it, it it basically would not work. So um, verbose, I think, is about messages that are displayed if something goes wrong. I I forget. Um, and the dot 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 is of course for arguments other than um, what um, the dot 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 is basically other arguments. But in terms of the signature, only what has been defined is what is going to be applied to the signature. So in other words, if you add on other uh, arguments to this function, you would not use that in your signature. Like, so your function definition, if you had x, y, and z, your signature would have x, y, and z, but not what you further defined in the dot dot. Um, so, um, so then moving on. So now that you you have the the generic defined, uh, we um, I'm so sorry, guys. I'm running out of charge on my phone, so that's why I'm a bit stressed. Do you mind if I just grab the charger? This is a beautiful day of all kinds of errors. Do you mind if I take a moment? You're good. I will be right back.
that. So what we saw so far is that we have defined the generic, and it was called my generic, and we specified the signature as X. So in other words, the argument to that function expects an object of class X. And so here when we set up the method, um, the function, it, it's going to look like this. It's going to say set method. It's going to have the name of the generic, and it's going to say person, and person is the signature here. So in other words, we're expecting an object of class person, and that would be the same thing that, that X here represents. So in other words, X is an object of class person. And then you would, uh, you would, uh, you would do the method implementation. So I thought that was kind of wild, Maya, because, um, and I, I mean, because of the fact that it, I guess it kind of makes it like more narrow and like better defined. And so I thought, I, I thought it was like really awesome relative to, to S3. It took me a little while to actually figure it out, but I think it's kind of cool. So, so more commonly, the second argument of set method is called the signature. In S4, unlike S3, the signature can include multiple arguments. So you could have multiple classes. And this makes the method dispatch in S4 substantially more complicated because you can imagine that if, uh, if this particular uh, method has two classes, let's say person and then um, they, uh, an, um, person and then maybe truck driver, for example, and you had methods defined in both of those classes, then you can imagine that if you wanted to figure out where that method would have to be where you would need to get the definition for that method and they were defined in both of those classes, it becomes extremely complicated as you see later to figure out where, which methods we actually need to use. So when, if you want to see all the methods that your generic uh, has, then you could, um, you, there's a way to look that up. You can look up all your um, methods in either your generic or all your methods in a class. So um, this would tell you um, if you have multiple generics to find and then you define the methods for them. There's a way to look up all of those. And then if you had a class with different generics and those different generics had, had classes, uh, had methods, then you, you could look it up by the way. So, um, and this is the actual definition of methods that you see here um, all the way at the bottom. So, okay, so this is what I was trying to get to earlier. I don't know if you can see this. Uh, it says signatures X, target is person, and define this person. So in other words, what it's saying is that the um, the generic was defined in person, and you also defined your method in person. So both your target, it was um, that yours was also defined in the same class where you actually, um, I guess, specified the the format of the call. So because as you can imagine, that's probably not going to be the same because you could you could in in theory have a generic in one class and the methods in a different class. So that's something to keep in mind. So, okay, so if you wanted to create a new uh, method called show, for example, in the person class, you, so in other words, you, this, is, this is something like a print. So it is a print, it's something similar to what print does in the background, um, and you wanted to actually create that. So obviously the first thing you would do is, um, you didn't need to define the generic because it's probably already been defined somewhere else. So show is a pretty standard method. So the generic has been defined elsewhere, and you're actually defining the method here with this class person because you're the, let's assume hypothetically you're the first person that has ever created this class called person. So this particular method does not exist for a class like person because this class never ever existed. So you would define that here in your person class. And the reason you didn't do set generic is probably because that generic has, has been defined elsewhere because show is a pretty common uh, method. So you have show, then it's, it, the, the person is your signature and it's coming from a single class. So in other words, your function, which has object as an argument, should be, of, um, should be an object of class person. And then you are basically determining how you want to uh, print it out. So you're doing a cat, and then uh, you're accessing the, the slots, and you have a separator. And because there's no age defined, you only get the name, and then that's it. So, um, so we actually saw a, a way where you can create a new method, but you didn't have to create a generic because it's probably already existing. 
Okay, so yeah, and so now it really starts to get a little bit sticky because um, this is where uh, we get into things like single inheritance, multiple inheritance, single inheritance, but multiple <laughs> dispatch, and the absolute worst of them all, multiple inheritance and multiple dispatch. As you can imagine, that's a real cluster. So S4 dispatch is complicated because S4 has two important features. You have multiple in inheritance and you also have multiple dispatch. So they make it powerful, but it's also really hard to figure it out. So Hattie came up with a slightly uh, tongue in the cheek way of doing this. He has this emoji thing uh, and it's basically a graph. So the only things that you really need to focus on are is the, the cool uh, emoji, the sunglass emoji, and you can see that it's, uh, it's, multi, um, it's multiple inheritance, and the other one is the guy with the, a slightly one, one uh, pupil is larger than the other, and then the one where he's got a rear thing, and then the other guy with no, uh, with no mouth. So like those are the two uh, things that he's gonna be focusing on. So I hope you know what I'm talking about. It's the multiple inheritance one right on top, which still leads to the same guy with no mouth. And the other one is the guy sticking out his tongue with one large pupil and then, so, so that guy has, a, it's like three levels deep. Fast hierarchy is like three levels deep and the other guy is a multiple inheritance. Um, so, okay, so this is a single dispatch. And by dispatch, I mean, how does the generic know which method to call. So the simplest case would be a generic function that dispatches on a single class with a single parent. So what you see on top is actually the function argument. So just think about that as um, f of um, whatever, f of x or something like that, where x is a object of class person. So even though it looks a little bit confusing, it's literally like one argument. So don't be misled by those arrows. It just means that it's a single argument function and what you see at the bottom is basically that you, um, this guy is being inherited from this guy, and this guy is coming from this guy. But so th this is basically like the lineage. So you could, um, as you can imagine, the guy, the guy, the very first guy with the tongue sticking out, he inherits methods and slots from the guy before him, so on and so forth. So the very first guy is what you call the terminal, the terminal class. So. Um, so for multiple inheritance, oh, I'm sorry, I think I'm sorry. Okay. Okay, so, th so this was the simplest case and what we saw earlier, where you have a, a single argument and you have, um, um, basically you have all the methods here and it's, it's easy to figure out where each one belongs. Um, okay, I'm sorry about this. So I just noticed something. It says here the bottom part is the method graph and displays all the possible methods that could be defined. Methods that, methods that exist have been defined with test method and they have a gray background. So I just noticed now that the last guy, the terminal node is the only one that had it gray, so there is no ambiguity here. If you are trying to call a function, it will go all the way back. Uh, if you're trying to call a method, it's like it's gonna go all the way back to the very first terminal node because that's the only place where it's been defined. So that's a straight, uh, straight shot, no uh, ambiguity. You don't, you don't have that method being defined in other places. So the gray uh, coloring basically is the place where that particular method has been defined. And in this case, it's in that one last terminal class. So when you get into multiple inheritance where you can have multiple parents, it, like I said, it, it gets a little bit confusing. So the guy with, sunglasses, he, um, he can, um, his parents are like, it's, it's either the guy who is just the sunglasses or it, it goes down the other way. So it's, he, it's just like multiple inheritance here for the final guy with the sunglasses. So the basic process remains the same. You start from the actual class, which was supplied to the generic, and then you follow the arrows until you find the defined method. Right, so like with the previous one, we didn't have an issue because we started with the guy that got his tongue out and then we just followed this down and we found the class where it's been defined and boom, we are done. But here what happens is that because there are multiple arrows and you're sort of segueing back and forth, you would need to pick a method that is the closest. So in other words, it is the least distance you have to travel. So for example, 
the guy, the distance from the guy with the sunglasses to the guy with no mouth is two because that's parent of parent. So that's his grandparent. So that's two. And the distance from him to the guy smiling is one. And the distance from him to the guy to just the sunglasses is one. So you would always pick if you had to make a choice, you would pick the least length of distance that you would have to travel. Sort of like a, I, I guess your the number of edges and your nodes, kind of like graph theory. So if no method has been found, it's going to be highlighted with a, a red double outline. And alternatively, what happens if you have the method, the, the method that you're looking for, they are, they've been defined in both of these classes. So then you really don't know what class, what method to pick for this. And as it turns out, Hadley says that you just, in this case, because of lack of alternatives, you just pick the one that's alphabetically uh, earlier and that shows up alphabetically earlier. So that, I mean, you can imagine the ambiguity there. So, um, and the reason that he's highlighted the guy with the red is because of what it was said earlier, that you typically want the methods to be defined in the terminal nodes or terminal classes. So in other words, when you start creating your classes and then you have all the inheritance, you want the definitions of those methods to reside in that class, uh, which you had originally decided um, needed whatever the functionality. So let's say you want to be able to uh, do some data, do some operations on a numeric vector, then you it makes sense to define your method right there. So the thing that Hadley says in this book is that make sure that your terminal classes or your terminal nodes have your method definition. So then that way you're not you're not exactly going to uh, it kind of goes away from oops if you have methods defined in different places down that chain if you don't need to. So that's why it makes more sense to define it in the terminal classes or the terminal nodes. So yeah, so this is a little bit kind of confusing, but actually it's, um, it looks like a lot, but it's really not so much. So with multiple inheritances, it's hard to simultaneously prevent ambiguity, ensure that every terminal method has an implementation, and minimize the number of defined methods. So basically, you don't know do you go this way or that way, or, uh, or like I just said, that your method which you had um, that it was defined in the terminal class, so the very first class where uh, that method needed, where you, where you needed that functionality of that particular method that you had to find it right there before you started that down the whole chain of inheritances. And that way you don't have to define it in multiple classes down the line because that really goes against the principles of OOPS and maybe the, the, the strongest points of, uh, of uh, you know, object-oriented programming. So he says that of all of the six ways that you can see uh, the way, uh, de depending on where the methods are defined, he says that there's just one that's free of problems. So I don't know if you can see the gray, but the first guy actually has it defined there. So like if you if you look at the, the one all the way to the left on top, the sunglass guy has it, but then the terminal classes don't have it. And so that's why they've been highlighted with the red. Uh, the one below that, the both the, the guy smiling and the guy with no mouth have it. So that's why they both have the gray background. But you don't want that. I mean, ideally, you don't want the smiling guy to implement that method unless there was a really strong reason to do that. Because if it's already there in the guy with no mouth, then it would make sense that it stayed there and you didn't have to necessarily um, define it again. Uh, you didn't have to implement it again. Um, and then the uh, and the all the places where the double red exists, that means that it's supposed to be implemented there, but it's not. And the reason that it's supposed to be implemented is because it's the terminal method uh, or the terminal class. Um, I'm not sure if anyone has any questions. This is not like the easiest thing to explain okay. because uh, I, did, is, I have a question. Is this is this common amongst all? object-oriented systems that support multiple inheritance, or is this peculiar to S4, uh, how difficult it is? You know, I don't know, I think Tan or Tony or <laughs> might be in a better position to answer that, I'm not sure. I know enough. All I know besides R is JavaScript, and that does not have multiple inheritance. This is chaos. 
Yeah. I think, I think it does kind of like this paradigm does kind of exist. I mean, I never studied all the levels to the extent that I needed to worry about all this uh, inheritance stuff. Uh, but I, I, I would imagine the same paradigm exists in the because I think you just really like laying it out and showing the, the flaws of it, focusing on that. Yeah. I mean, it, it almost seems like he prefers multiple, um, what is it called? Multiple, um, uh, what is that word? I'm so sorry. Um, he prefers multiple dispatch to multiple inheritance. Like I read a bunch of articles by him, like both in the textbook and outside. And it seems that the general um, like word on the street is that multiple dispatch is preferred to multiple inheritance. And I, this is frankly the first I've heard that as well. Uh, uh, Tyler, so I was like, wow, that's kind of really unique. Like I, yeah, I guess this is what we call operator overloading, right, guys? Like in Java, isn't that what it is? Like you can have the same function, different classes, different number of whatever. But I always thought like inheritance and like multiple inheritance was like the gold standard. But it appears here that it's not. Like it's not the preferred. Yeah, actually, I think, yeah, the operator overloading that makes a lot of sense. Like, I guess I didn't think about it like that, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, I, of course, I mean, admittedly, I quit Java in 2003, but then, like, inheritance was, like, just the thing, right? Like, it was something that everyone thought was, like, the solution to, like, everything. So, I don't know, this, this could be, like, just an evolution of functional programming, but it was pretty, it, it was news to me as well. Um, so, it really gets hairy here, and I'm not even sure I want to attempt like explain this because um, frankly, I think there are some articles which articulate this better like by text than they do here because these did nothing for me, honestly. But I actually found some which um, textually and like just by doing it, they, um, I, and I actually did this in the, in, in, in the console and I, uh, I felt like I, I understood it better. So I'm, I'm more than happy to forward that. But Basically, what this is is that it's saying um, is that if you remember the signature where the generic has to figure out which method to invoke, and if you have two classes and they both have that particular method defined, how would you know which method needs to be defined? So this is really the part where the generic has to segue into where to grab that method definition from. And I will tell you that th this representation did nothing for me. So I'm not even sure I'm going to try and explain that because I'm not, I don't think I would do a very good job of that at all. So I don't know if anyone wants to take a stab at that. I, I don't think I would do any justice to So, um, anyway, but you can see that there's a comma between the two. And so that basically there's like two arguments that's being passed there. So, yeah, I mean, and the next one is like even worse because it actually gets into, oh, I probably did not include that, but um, that that's actually multiple inheritance and multiple dispatch. And um, this this is only multiple dispatch, but the other one has both. And that's like a serious thing. That's completely absolute. Oh, you know what? It is actually this. This. Not that it's going to make any sense, but... Uh, it's, it's that. So this is apparently a case of multiple inheritance. I'm not sure if it's multiple dispatch, but it's it's multiple inheritance. So um, oh, and the one the two is actually multiple dispatch, and uh, I'm actually just noticing it now. So you can see that it looks less complex, whereas the multiple inheritance is just like not so. This is multiple inheritance, and this is actually your, yeah, and this is um, just multiple dispatch. Uh, so, um, sorry, I can't um, speak any more about that, but I will be sure to um, pass the, those articles that I came across. But um, that's all for me. Um, I. I don't know if a light coding would have served a better purpose, but I did not have the courage to do to take that on as yet. Maybe someday. 
I thought this was awesome. A really good, like, high level um, discussion because all this stuff is pretty new to me. So I thought this was a great introduction. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? Oh, uh, is there, do you, does anyone know if there's partial matching with the slots? Like there is in base bar with dollar signs and typing out common names? Sorry, uh, were you asking me that? Sorry. Well, anyone, I guess. <laughs> Oh, actually, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I did not actually pay attention. I, I was looking at the chat messages. Sorry, what, what were you saying? Oh, is, I was asking if anyone knows if there's partial matching with uh, the names of the plots. Uh, like, you know, if, I don't know if, uh, if MC Cars was uh, an S4 class and I wanted to you know, get the MPG column and say it's a slot instead, I typed in you know, empty cars at M, would it recognize that slot? Or you have to type in the whole name? Ah, I see. So you're talking about that example where he actually passes in empty cars where um, a person was expected. Is that correct? Yeah, I kind of already told that. I just, I just Googled it and this says slots can only be referred to by name, not by position, and there's no partial, partial matching of names as with list elements. Oh, well, I guess I could have Googled that. <laughs> <laughs> um, my, I had a question about, what was it called? Virtual methods, is that wrong? Something with a V. Well, yeah, virtual, virtual class. 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 What, what is yeah. that? You know, I, I read that. I could not figure that out. It, it, was, it just went over the top of my head. It looked so complex. I don't think he touches upon that here, does he? I don't think he does. I know it's, it's com so I downloaded this John Chambers, like the original book where he actually gets into like, um, and it's a really fantastic uh, PDF. I, um, I'm going to uh, share that as well in Slack. And I think he does a really great job explaining, um, like it's, um, um, it's actually, I think, it's not as confusing, like parts of this, um, like multiple dispatch, especially, I got really confused in the advanced R book. So uh, I'm going to drop that um, John Chambers uh, PDF as well, which is like his book, um, Structure of R or something to that effect. But it, it's really well explained. And I think there's virtual classes there, but I did not actually read that. Is it kind of like a an interface where you're just defining methods that could exist, but don't, you can't, you don't actually have an implementation of them? Yes, so that's correct. So I, what you mean the virtual classes, is that it? Yeah, it's like a class that you can't instantiate, but I don't get why you would want that. Yeah. Well, it might help you know, in, in terms of dispatching and 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 collecting similar logic, without yeah, you know, helping you direct where the logic should go. I think this, um, t Tony, it seems like the slot was being based on class, correct? Not necessarily like matched by name. So I think the empty cars, because it's of a different class than, um, I guess, either character or numeric, right? I think is why, um, right? So that I think that's probably why it, it says it expects um, slot name and it actually got a data frame, which is empty cars. Well, yeah, I guess you have to do the work of converting empty cars to an S4 class uh, before you can actually uh, yeah. check it. Uh, but I, uh, yeah. I might look it up, because uh, if Google's correct, then there is no partial <laughs> matching. 
I hate virtual matching anyways. I just thought it was a, I just wanted to know the answer. So I would never use partial matching. So, so my, my computer, just, I just lost power. So like if there was ever like a case of everything going wrong, this would have to be it. I just lost power on my, on my laptop. So, so <laughs> at least I, it happened when you're done. <laughs> I know really, but oh my God, what a cluster. I hope, I'm really hoping I can edit out all of these embarrassing little bits from the, from the video, because it's gonna like, it's gonna suck if other groups listen to this. <laughs> I'll definitely try to lost there. Um, we still on? Beginning off until we got started though. Yeah. Cool. That was great. I realized I was on mute for a lot of that, so uh, I didn't really think about that because my screen was a little dark so I wasn't seeing my lips move or anything like that so that was entertaining. <laughs> I don't think I had anything really interesting to say though. So. Yeah same this is all really new for me. I, I was thinking as like a homework exercise I might now make like a really basic class in S3, S4, and R6 and just to like see how structurally they are um, different. So when you were supposed to like cluster this with trade-offs, but I think trade-offs might actually deserve its own like working session kind of thing. Um, I think that might be an interesting. I thing. concur. When you use one or another or another, or even cool. just. Cool. Um, we could do that next week. What What would you want that to kind of look like? So Hadley talks about some of the differences. So probably go over those. Um, and then maybe a live code as to like, or just ideas or crowdsourcing ideas if you had any about when we would use it or like practical applications of. I know I just put S3 into my pack, into my R pack, one of the packages I'm working on right now, um, because I thought it was a convenient way to do things. Um, but maybe we could look at something like that and talk about like ways I'm using it or something. I guess I'm setting myself up. So you're nominating yourself to lead this discussion? Yeah, pretty much. Awesome. Uh, Is everyone will, cool with that and kind of postponing uh, our readings? Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. Cool. All right. Yeah. So let's, I'll like throw that in the chat um, that that's the plan, but I like that idea. Cool. Because I still don't know when I, why I would use R6 instead of S3 for it, but maybe I'll go into the intro. Yeah, I, I, using I have a feeling that they're not, I have a feeling that they're not redundant, that you want them in different scenarios, but I could be wrong. Maybe Tyler can speak more to that. I guess it, it depends on the specific use case you're going to show us, though. Yeah, so maybe that, that maybe we'll just uh, take, a, take a walk through a package and uh, talk. Cool usage and why we use one or the other. Sounds good to me. Cool. All right. Well, I think that's it for me. Um, and I'll see you guys next Tuesday. Thanks All right. Again. Have a good night. Thanks again. Bye. Bye.